Today's passage comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, and it's found on page 965 in the Pew Bible. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. The word of the Lord. Thank you, Silvana. How's everybody doing this morning? Doing all right? Good? Today we're continuing on in our sermon series on 2 Corinthians. I want to thank Pastor Eric for preaching last week. I always love it. Pastor Eric, whenever he begins his sermons, he always thanks me for giving him the opportunity to preach. And I'm like, well, thank you, because I wasn't able to preach, and so I'm glad that you're doing it. So I just want to acknowledge that I'm grateful for him, and I'm grateful for all of our uh, team of teachers and preachers here at Calvary that bring God's Word to us each week. And uh, whether that's here uh, from the pulpit on Sunday mornings or in our classes, but grateful for the effective uh, teachers that we have uh, here at Calvary. So this morning, we're continuing on through 2 Corinthians, and we only have two verses uh, in our passage, uh, two verses that might seem a bit random. Paul, seemingly uh, out of nowhere, starts talking about going to Troas, not meeting Titus there, and then going on to Macedonia. And on a quick read, or even on a slow read, it's not clear what Paul is talking about or why he's talking about it. And to be honest, and I always try to be honest when I'm preaching, uh, this isn't the sort of passage that a preacher would normally be drawn to. And I thought about just skipping past it and kind of like tucking it into the, the verses that follow after, because I knew I'm going to do, do with those, but thought I could just kind of read these quick and move on and you wouldn't, wouldn't notice. But <laughs> these passages, these two verses, they, they, they stuck out like such a sore thumb that I, I thought I should take a little bit of time to try to figure out why they were there. And so as I studied and read on these verses, they started making more sense to me. So much so that I came up with a whole sermon on this. So this morning, we're going to try to get inside of Paul's logic and see what relevance, if any, these two verses of Scripture have for us. What we have in these two verses is a window into Paul's heart of ministry. And understanding Paul's heart for ministry then helps us understand our calling and what should be our heart for ministry. Now, I imagine that the points of application that I'm going to draw out here are going to have the most direct relevance for folks that are in full-time pastoral ministry or full-time church ministry or in other ministry contexts. But these, this passage also has relevance for anyone who's called to minister in any capacity. And so whether that's a lay or volunteer capacity in church, such as an elder or a deacon, a small group leader, a youth group leader, such as we saw uh, the students went on uh, the trip recently, maybe children's ministry workers and so forth, whether that's inside the church, whether that's outside the church at organizations like By the Hand or perhaps the field school or maybe informal ways just serving in ministry in your own family. So here's what we're going to do with these two verses this morning with the sermon. We're going to, I want to give a bit more detail first about the historical backdrop or context that lies underneath these verses. Then we're going to look at these two verses, and then I'm going to draw out three points of application. So first the context, then verses 12 and 13, and then three points of application. All right, so the context. I've pointed out uh, in past weeks, in the first number of uh, weeks of this series, that one of Paul's main purposes in writing 2 Corinthians was to explain to the Corinthians why he hadn't come to visit them, and also, as he said that he was going to, and to assure them that he really did love them. And that theme is going to carry all the way through into our two verses this morning. But I want to add a bit more detail about the historical situation, the, the context 
something that had occurred between Paul and the Corinthians, which is going to help us understand this text a little bit better. Now, my wife and I, you don't all know this, but my wife and I, we love to watch that show Monk. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but Monk is, we got one other person, but Monk is a, uh, he's a detective for those who haven't seen this show. And whenever it gets to the, the end of the show and he's about to reveal who murdered who, he says, here's what happened. And then he like tells the whole thing. So here's what happened. I'm going to give you the whole scenario here of what was going on in Corinth. Paul planted the church at Corinth, which we read about in Acts 18. He spent about a year and a half there. And up to that point in Paul's ministry, his time in Corinth was the longest that he had spent anywhere. And during that time, he developed a particular fondness for the Corinthians and they for him. After a year and a half, he left and continued on with his ministry, planting other churches in different parts of Asia and Greece. But after he had gone, something went wrong back in Corinth. We don't know exactly what, but someone began causing problems for Paul and for the Corinthians. That's the someone that Paul is referring to in the, past, in the passage that Pastor Eric preached from last week. The someone that the Corinthians uh, had to forgive and that Paul forgave and that, Corinthian, that the Corinthians needed to lighten up on a little bit because maybe the punishment was too severe. So there's this someone that has done something in the backdrop. Now, here's where we have to read between the lines a little bit in all of the Corinthian correspondence. And scholars think that there are possibly two likely someones that Paul has in mind here. Uh, one of them, this someone might be uh, one of the super apostles that Paul later references in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, who had begun to undermine Paul's ministry, had come in after Paul had left and begun to undermine Paul's ministry and turned the Corinthians somewhat against Paul. Or the someone may have been the person that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, who had committed flagrant sexual immorality, was having an affair with his stepmother, and the Corinthians were letting it slide. So Paul had to address that. Or perhaps it was some other someone that he doesn't mention in his letters or some other issue that we don't know about. But whatever the case, when Paul made his second visit after he had come back uh, from planting Corinth, the church in Corinth, when he made his second visit, conflict ensued between Paul and this someone. And the Corinthians, it seemed, and we can pick this up from reading uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, they had stayed a bit on the sidelines. Their support for Paul's side of the matter had not been obvious. So Paul felt a little bit hung out to dry by the Corinthians as he came back to deal with this issue. He's tried to deal with it, and the Corinthians sort of all stepped back a little bit. So consequently, Paul left. When Paul left, things had not been fully resolved with this someone. So consequently, he left unhappy with the mysterious troublemaking someone. He was unhappy with how the Corinthians had been putting up with or handling this troublemaking someone in his absence. And he was unhappy with the Corinthians that they had stepped back and not been more clearly supportive of him as he was trying to deal with the problem. All of which is to say, he left unhappy with the Corinthians and they could tell. The whole visit had been painful. That's what Paul mentions here in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, this painful second visit. Now, Paul left telling the Corinthians that he was going to come back for a third visit at a specified time. But then later, he changed his mind, and he didn't appear, and instead, he wrote them a letter. And in the letter, he expressed his hurt, he rebuked them for their lack of support, and he defended the appropriateness of his actions and his ministry against this someone. Now, we don't have that letter. It's a lost letter, but Paul refers to it a number of times in 2 Corinthians. Now, I've got a map. We're going to put it up on the screen here because this will help you get your bearings on what happens next between Paul and the Corinthians. Paul sent this now lost letter from somewhere in Asia probably Ephesus, by the hand of Titus, that's the blue line that you can see, that's kind of Titus's route, by the hand of Titus, who is one of his key traveling companions. Now, Titus traveled west across the Aegean Sea to deliver Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 
while Paul traveled up north, that's the red line, by land to the city of Troas. And the plan between Titus and Paul was for Titus to continue on north after having delivered the letter to the Corinthians to deliver, to continue up on north through Greece into Macedonia, go across Macedonia, across the Hellespont, and then come down into Troas where Paul would be ministering. And there Titus would deliver the report on what had been going on and happening in Corinth. Paul would receive the report, assess the situation, and then make plans accordingly. Now, we know from reading 2 Corinthians 7 and also bits of chapter 2 that Titus's visit to Corinth went very well. The matter was cleared up and the Corinthians dealt with the someone, this troublemaking someone, perhaps even too severely, it seems, as we saw in last week's passage. And they, affirmed, they reaffirmed their love for Paul and their loyalty to him. But the Corinthians knew that Paul had left feeling somewhat betrayed, and they hadn't yet reconciled fully with him. And they knew that Titus was going to travel up north through Macedonia to meet Paul in Troas, to bring his report about them to Paul. And that brings us to 2 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. Now we're going to keep the map up here for just a little bit longer because we're going to help it have it make sense here of verses 12 and 13. In verse 12... Paul tells the Corinthians that when he got to Troas, there was a wide open door of ministry for him. But when Titus was long in coming, Paul began to grow anxious. Not just because he was anxious to see Titus, but also because he wanted to hear the news that Titus would be bringing about the Corinthians. Because as anxious as the Corinthians were to hear about how Paul felt about them, he was also anxious to hear about how they felt about him. So remember, he hadn't yet heard from Titus since he sent Titus over to Corinth. So he didn't know that the meeting had gone well with Titus. So for all he knew, things in Corinth were still a mess and he and the Corinthians were still at odds with each other. And so in verse 13, he tells the Corinthians that even with the door of ministry, this open door of ministry in Troas. He had no rest in his spirit. And so he took leave of Troas and went on to Macedonia. Now, why did he tell them he went on to Macedonia? It's because he knew that they knew that Macedonia was the route that Titus would be traveling on his way to meet Paul in Troas to bring Paul word about the Corinthians. All right, so you follow this so far? Right, there's a lot of moving pieces here to keep track of. But basically, Paul is telling the Corinthians in these verses, I was so eager to hear Titus's report about you all that I couldn't wait any longer. I left an open door of ministry because I couldn't rest easy until I knew that we were in good relational harmony again. All of which is to say Paul is mentioning Titus and Troas and Macedonia here because it underscores the point that he is wanting to make in writing this letter. He wants the Corinthians to know how much he cares about them and how much they have been on his heart and mind. Paul is saying, I was so eager to hear about you that I left an open field of ministry, a fruitful field of ministry, and raced on ahead to find Titus. That's how much I care about you. In other words, you're heavy on my heart and you're more important to me than an open door of ministry. Or perhaps most simply, what I think Paul wants to communicate to the Corinthians is, I love you. All right, we can pull the map down now. Let me draw out three points of application here. As I said at the outset, I'm drawing out the points of application that are going to have perhaps the most direct relevance for folks who are in vocational ministry. So that would be, you know, we are our ministry staff here, but we have missionaries that serve locally in other contexts or in other ministry uh, full-time vocational contexts. And so this would apply maybe perhaps most directly to them. But there's relevance here, as I said, for all of us who engage in ministry in any kind of lay or volunteer way. And here's the first point of application to be made here about ministry. And it's this, that we are not called to ministry chiefly by open doors of ministry, but by the Holy Spirit. We're not called to ministry 
chiefly by open doors of ministry, but by the Holy Spirit. As Paul acknowledges in verse 12, he had an open door of ministry in Troas. He even implies that this open door of ministry was in the Lord, or as some translations read, by the Lord. But Paul, in spite of this open door of ministry in Troas, he had no rest in his spirit, he said. And so he left it behind. And what we see here is that our engagement in ministry is not determined merely by the presence of a ministry opportunity, but by how the Holy Spirit speaks to us in our spirit. There are a couple times in Paul's ministry where we can see this dynamic even more clearly. You take, for example, Acts chapter 16. And Luke, the gospel writer who also wrote the book of Acts, he's detailing or chronicling Paul's uh, travel uh, throughout the the Greco-Roman Empire. And this is what Luke writes. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. And I've always found this passage rather intriguing. It's not that the border patrol kept them out of going into Mysia. There was no border patrol in the Roman Empire. and Paul was a Roman citizen. He had free access to all of these places. It wasn't something that blocked him from being able to go except the Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus spoke to Paul and his traveling companions and said, this is not where I want you to go. I want you to go over here. And so they went on down to Troas. Now listen, the folks in Mysia needed to hear the word of the Lord and the preaching of the gospel just as much as the folks in Troas. But Paul doesn't just follow every ministry opportunity or need. He follows the spirit of Jesus. And that occasionally meant walking away from obvious points of need and ministry opportunities. Now, yes, one of the ways that the spirit leads us into ministry is by bringing open doors of opportunity into our lives. But the mere presence of a ministry need doesn't mean that it's your need to meet. Now I'm going to pause here because after I, I, I preached the first sermon, Taylor, our children's ministry director, came up and she rebuked me and she said, I'm trying to recruit people to serve in children's ministry and we have a great need and you just told them all that the need is irrelevant. So let me just back and just say, as it relates to children's ministry... <laughs> The presence of a ministry need is the calling. But in everything else in life, it's not. All right. No, we really could use your help in children's ministry need. You, you, you pray about that and see what the Lord speaks to you. Right. But the mere presence of a ministry need does not mean that it is necessarily your need to meet. And maybe that's especially a word for some of you dutiful, earnest types this morning. Because perhaps every time you encounter a need, you feel obligated to meet that need. And then, of course, you can't meet every need. So then you feel guilty that you have let the needs pass you by. And I would say to you, if that's you, just be at peace. Because God does not expect you to meet every need or to solve every problem. Not every need that you come across is your need to meet. And what I can tell you by personal experience is that if you let circumstances of opportunity determine your ministry engagement, you will exhaust yourself because there is no end to circumstances of opportunity. Like Paul, our call to ministry should be spirit-directed, not merely circumstance-directed. Or perhaps you have the same problem, but in the opposite direction. You too are letting circumstances determine your ministry calling. But for you, it means laying around on the couch. And you don't see any circumstances or immediate ministry needs. And so you assume that God has nothing for you to do. So your circumstances don't present a clear ministry need. And so you aren't engaging in ministry. But that's just as much a mistake too. 
Just because you're not seeing a ministry's need doesn't mean Jesus doesn't have a ministry need for you to fulfill. And I would say to you, have you asked him lately? Have you checked in with him? Maybe while you're lying there on the couch, you could ask him if he has something for you to do. I know that's how it works with my wife. I'm just laying there on the couch. I don't see any needs, but she has some things for me to do. (laughs) Which is why I don't ask, because I don't have to get off my couch. Maybe that's why you're not asking the Lord, because it's comfortable on your couch, right? Just because you don't see circumstances or needs around you doesn't mean that there aren't things that need to be done. And sometimes we just need to ask. In all cases, Paul's example here and then throughout his life help us see that Jesus, not our circumstances, is the ultimate determiner of how and when we should engage in ministry. Now, everything I'm saying here presupposes, of course, that we have intimacy with Jesus sufficient that we were able to be led by his spirit. I'm not saying you're going to hear an audible voice, but I am saying... But if you open yourself up in prayer, you sincerely, to the best of your ability, surrender yourself to God's will, and you seek Jesus' direction for your life, he will speak to you in your spirit, just like he did with Paul. Because Christianity isn't just a set of religious practices or moral principles. It is that. But even more deeply, it's a personal relationship the living Jesus who wants us to know him and personally interact with him and who wants us to be led uniquely by him. And it can take time to learn to hear the voice of Jesus and to sense the leading of his spirit. But when it comes to ministry, don't just settle for reading the circumstantial tea leaves. Learn to listen for the voice of Jesus in your spirit beyond your circumstances. All right, so the first point of application is that we are not called to ministry merely by ministry opportunities, but by the Holy Spirit. Second, we are not called to love ministry generally, but people specifically. We're not called to love ministry generally, generally, but people specifically. Paul was dedicated to ministry. His whole life was dedicated to ministry. But you know what he was even more dedicated to? He was even more dedicated to the people of his ministry. Because ministry for Paul wasn't just an abstract idea or a general calling. It was a calling to love a very particular set of people. And that's why Paul was so concerned about the Corinthians and why he so easily walked away from an open door of ministry in Troas. I think this makes sense for those of us. Uh, we, can, we can see this perhaps even just how we think about parents or, or, or parents thinking about children rather, right? Before I was a parent, I liked children. Children were, you know, good to have in the world. I was glad with, that they were around, generally speaking, right? But then you have your own children and suddenly your love for children becomes so much more focused, Right? Because it's not just children generally that you love, however much you might love children, but you, became, you become very particular about your own children. And there's a uniqueness to your own children. And your children have your heart in ways that children in general do not. And that's the same thing with pastoral ministry. Listen, I love pastoral ministry, but what I love even more than pastoral ministry is you all. And there aren't any ministry opportunities that are bigger or better that I'm keeping my eyes on, hoping that they're going to come along my way. I've always felt like the Lord was calling me to be the senior pastor of a congregation. And now that I'm here, I've got no desire to go anywhere else. You all have my heart and all the other ministry opportunities at bigger or more influential churches can pass me by as far as I'm concerned. My point is not that every pastor needs to stay forever at the same church. And sometimes Jesus does call us to different fields of ministry. Paul didn't stay forever at Corinth. He was called to other fields of ministry. And I've served at three different churches. 
But my point is that the people of one's ministry are not mere stepping stones to bigger and better fields of ministry. The people of one's ministry are the ministry. If you're a pastor, you shouldn't love preaching more than you love your people. And you shouldn't love leadership more than you love your people. And you shouldn't love ministry vision more than you love your people. You shouldn't even love people more than you love your people. Because your people, your very specific people, they're the whole reason that you preach and lead and have ministry vision. And it was because Paul loved the Corinthians specifically more than he loved ministry generally that he walked away from Troas. Now, not all of you are pastors or ministry leaders or students preparing to be pastors or ministry leaders. Some of you are. But others of you, as I've mentioned, are serving in volunteer capacities in your local church or outside the church in some other field of ministry at home or whatever. And what I would say to all of us, however we serve, wherever we serve, based on Paul's example from this text, is that Jesus is calling us to serve our people as the priority. So the question is not, do you love ministry for Jesus? The question is, do you love the people Jesus is calling you to minister to? You may love teaching. I love teaching. You may love leading. I love leading. You may love working with young people or leading folks in worship. But do you love even more the people you teach and the people you lead and the young people that you work with and the folks that you lead in worship? The people we minister to, not the ministries, should have our heart. Because for as long as Jesus calls us to that particular ministry, the whole point of the ministry is the people that the ministry serves. So the first point of application is that we are not called to ministry merely by ministry opportunities, but by the Holy Spirit. And second, we're not called to love ministry generally, but people specifically. And the third point, and I'll let you in on a little secret here, my main point and making the second point was to make this third point. The third point is this. And I think this is a burden throughout all of Paul and 2 Corinthians. Paul's pastoral posture towards the Corinthians reflects Jesus' pastoral posture towards us. One of the things we see all throughout 2 Corinthians is the parallel that Paul constantly draws between Jesus' care for Paul, Paul's care for the Corinthians, and the Corinthians' care for each other and the world. All three sets of relationships are meant to work the same way. So when we're seeing how Paul cares for the Corinthians, we're seeing not just an example of how we should care for others, but even more importantly, how Jesus cares for us. Jesus doesn't just care about ministry generally, nor about people generally. He cares about us very specifically and uniquely. We're not just ministry opportunities to him. For Jesus, the whole point of Christianity is the people that Christianity serves. Everything he does is born out of his love for his people. His teaching, his leadership, his miracles, all of that is in service of you and I. I think sometimes we can get it in our heads that that God has given us in Christ a religious system and rules and scripture and ethics and morals and ways to live as though that's the whole point of Christianity. And then we're the little sort of uh, uh, like privates in God's army that are like adhering to this greater thing. And this greater thing is the thing. But that's exactly the inverse of how God intends it. That God has given us our religious traditions and our systems and our rules and our ethics not to sit above us, but to come underneath us and to support the people that he loves and he cares about. Remember when Jesus came and he began to get into conflict with the Pharisees about the law. And the Pharisees were prioritizing the law over people. And Jesus says, you have it backwards. The Sabbath, which was a major 
uh, ordinance in the law, the Sabbath, Jesus said, was not made, the, the, the Sabbath was not made for man, but man was made for the Sabbath. I reverse that. <laughs> man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. Right? The whole point of the law Jesus was teaching was to serve people, to serve God's people. And it's the same way with pastoral ministry and Jesus' interaction with us. We are the point of his ministry in the world. We are not mere stepping stones to some other agenda. How good parents feel about their children and how Paul felt about the Corinthians is how Jesus feels about us. Like the father of the prodigal who ran out ahead to meet the prodigal son, like Paul racing out ahead to meet Titus in Macedonia to hear word of the Corinthians, Jesus is the good shepherd who races out to find the lost sheep because he loves his sheep more than he loves shepherding. Do you know that in the New Testament, the Greek term that gets translated as shepherd it's also the same term that gets translated as pastor. It's the same term. When it's used in reference to sheep, it gets translated as shepherd. When it's used in reference to people, it gets translated as pastor. But it's, it's fundamentally the same term because when a shepherd is shepherding sheep, he's pastoring the sheep. And when a pastor is pastoring his people, he's shepherding his people. Jesus is the good pastor who leaves the 99 in order to find the one. And the great sign that Jesus is the good pastor who loves his people more than he loves his ministry is that he's willing to lay aside his ministry, even to the point of death, in order to save his people. Because the good pastor lays down his life for his people. So do you know, be reminded this morning in the example of the Apostle Paul with the Corinthians, be reminded that you are the unique object of Jesus' love, his pastoral care, that you are the point of why he came to earth. He didn't come to earth to just generally save people because people are good. He came to earth to save you and to save me uniquely. If we try to minister to others without a sufficient awareness of how deeply Jesus is committed to ministering to us uniquely and personally as individuals, we're, we're either not going to be able to minister at all or we're going to burn ourselves out trying to minister in our own strength. Don't race past the love and concern and the regard that Jesus has for you. He has deep concern and care and regard for you. Uniquely, you, in your life context, living the life that you're living with, the people that are around you, he cares uniquely about you. And it's as you receive his pastoral care into your life, that you have pastoral care to give back into the lives of others. It's out of the overflow of Jesus' heart of love for us, that we will have a heart of love for others. God, we thank you that you sent Jesus to pastor us. And when we were the one lost sheep that had wandered away from the flock and we could not find our way back, when we were doomed to die alone in the wilderness, Jesus, the good pastor, came and he picked us up and he, at cost, great cost to himself, he has brought us back into the flock. And so, God, we, we thank you for Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to receive more and more fully the love and the grace and the pastoral care that he is pouring into our lives so that we can extend that same love and grace and pastoral, life, pastoral care into the lives of others. Thank you for loving us as you do in Christ. In his name we pray, amen.